When you think of the Phantom Menace, you might think of this. Now this is pod racing. Or you might even think of this. Huh? <laughs> but for me, I always think of this. Don't be alarmed. Esteemed Scottish actor and heartthrob Ewan McGregor is totally fine. That was just a scene from the PlayStation 1 game, Star Wars The Phantom Menace. I know it's hard to differentiate this from real life because the graphics are so freaking good. When The Phantom Menace came out, I was 10 years old, pretty much the perfect demographic for this movie. I was old enough to have seen the original trilogy and to develop a love for it, but young enough to not be able to discern good filmmaking from bad. So when the inevitable deluge of Phantom Menace merchandise and branded stuff hit shelves, you better believe I took part in the hype. Young Jedi trading cards, buying the soundtrack on CD, the kids meal toys. But there's one piece of shameless merchandising that I remember perhaps most fondly, and that's the official movie licensed game for the PS1 and PC. For Star Wars fans, 10 year olds psyched for the Phantom Menace and serial killers, this game was incredible. But something I don't remember as a 10 year old? Just how busted and glitchy this game is. It's one of the most broken games I've ever played, and it's kind of surprising that LucasArts released this game with so many issues, especially since the film was so highly anticipated. How is it possible for a business with that much money to screw up something this badly? That isn't to say that it isn't enjoyable. It's very enjoyable. In the same way, watching two billionaire man-children fight each other is enjoyable, but it is f the Phantom Menace game follows the events of the film, and throughout you'll play as Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, Padme, and Captain Pancake. It's a pretty straightforward action game that incorporates some platforming and puzzle solving, but mostly combat, with lightsabers, guns, and sparky forks that are absolutely useless against droidicas. Why did they even give me this? First off, I think it's really cool that they brought Sean Connery back to life just to voice Qui-Gon. The Viceroy's are cowards. This meeting will be short. Let's just call out the elephant in the room. There's a reason that people remember this game besides just the glitches and weird stuff, which we'll get into. What made this game so unique is that you could pretty much kill everyone and everything in the whole Star Wars universe. It's Grand Theft Auto Star Wars Edition, and it's something that no other Star Wars game attempted to do again, understandably so. This is a realization most players will probably make early on in the underwater city of Otagunga. The developers of the game make it pretty clear they aren't fans of Jar Jar. I mean, Obi-Wan is straight up uncharacteristically mean here. Why do we need that worthless creature? Qui-Gon also says something interesting here. He specifically tells you not to hurt the Gungans. And Obi-Wan, do not hurt these Gungans. I sense that you look down upon them, but they are living beings nonetheless. A sentiment that makes no sense for a Jedi to have to tell another Jedi. Well, that's because the developers are basically winking at the player here and saying, don't hurt the Gungans, seriously. I mean, a lot of the NPCs will straight up beg you to kill them. Watch out, it's a hairy stranger. Get out of my way before I blast you. You're so very ugly, Outlander. Oh, you stinky man, you smell like Bampa Poodoo. And here's the thing. There's almost never any consequence for killing NPCs, which kind of cements the idea that the developers wanted you to play this game as a stone cold killer. The more the game progresses, the more ridiculous it gets. I mean, you're a noble Jedi warrior, and nobody seems to have any issue with your killing sprees. Jar Jar obviously couldn't care less that you just murdered his kin. This way to the bango. Eventually, there are a few acknowledgements that you're killing people, but even then, nobody actually sees that it's you doing it. A vicious murderer has been killing innocent people all over town. While you could kill just about any NPC in this game, whenever you kill a main character, anything that would break the canon of the movie, you'll get a game over. Isn't that the smoke coming out of the other son, huh? Oh shit, did I just kill Hennigan's mom? Well, 
I guess there are a few main characters that can be killed without a game over. Don't judge me. I wasn't trying to kill her. I was trying to kill Anakin's friend. This is so wizard, Anakin. <laughs> Graphics-wise, this is not a pretty game, with blocky, ugly characters and pixelated environments, but then again, that was a lot of PlayStation 1 games. Damn, this kid is ugly. The PC version of the game smooths out the textures, which is nice, but then it strangely adds way too much shadow and darkness and makes everything look really drab. It's hard to say which version of the game looks better, but one thing's for sure, they both look real bad. The basic gameplay is fun, but the movement mechanics and physics make me want to leap into traffic. Most of the time this brokenness results in hilarious glitches, but occasionally it results in stuff that's just plain annoying. For example, in Naboo, when you're battling the AAT tank, it'll sometimes pin you against a corner, making it physically impossible to get away. Also, for some reason, getting shot at enough times here made me immortal, so I can't die, forcing me to have to reset the game. Yay! To the The puzzles in The Phantom Menace are both unfun and completely bogus. I mean, it shouldn't be this difficult for Captain Pancake to cross a bridge. Most of the issues in this game come down to some combination of broken physics and inexplicable design choices. In the last level, you play as Padme, and you start off with only this taser weapon, and it's completely useless against the bigger enemies, which forces you to have to stand around and let your NPC allies take care of them. Why on earth, at this point in the story, would Padme only be carrying a non-lethal weapon. She just got back from Slavery Planet and is about to liberate her home world from robot overlords. Time to lock and load, Queen. The writing of The Phantom Menace is actually kind of good in that there was clearly a lot of effort put into it. While for the most part it keeps the same spirit of the film, there's plenty of tongue-in-cheek lines that simultaneously tells the story and makes fun of the story at the same time. Things broken and no come back in law. <laughs> no comebacky law. In fact, the dialogue for Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Captain Pancake is all pretty good. Padme is annoying as hell, though. Don't worry about my safety. I've been trained in self-defense. Let's go. Help! Qui-Gon! Help! The music is pretty good, too, and for obvious reasons. It literally just plays the John Williams score from the movie. I mentioned a moment ago about the game being full of broken physics and inexplicable design choices. Sometimes that's annoying, but most of the time, it works in the game's favor because it makes the game unintentionally hilarious. He's likely to test your skills. How do I contact Jabba? We'll meet you at the- <laughs> help a murderer like you? Occasionally, between chapters, you'll get the joy of experiencing pre-rendered cutscenes which depict scenes from the film. The CGI and character modeling is about on par with Beast Wars here. <laughs> I mean, look at Anakin's dead eyes. I absolutely love how janky and ugly this game is. The character models are designed like a snowman with a head and arms stacked on a torso on top of legs. I know this is how rudimentary they're made, because the developers put in plenty of opportunities to horrifically, and hilariously, chop up the player into several bits. Ah! Ah! Holy sh**! That's pretty messed up for an all-ages Star Wars game, but it's something really weird that just adds to the charm. Other graphic limitations could be equally entertaining, such as this high-speed escape from Theed. or this high-speed explosion. And who could forget that famous scene from the movie where you meet this two-headed Gungan monstrosity? And as far as inexplicable design choices go, well, where do I even begin? This game is just saturated with them. Examples include... 
walking into a civilian's home and discovering an active crime scene. What the hell did you do? Jeez, did this guy owe you money or something? Damn, you didn't need to completely cover the floor in his blood. Putting fish tanks in Udagunga. Y'all live underwater. If you want to look at a fish, just look out the window, stupid. And a shockingly anticlimactic final boss. Speaking of anticlimactic, there's a few scenes in particular that really fell flat, though it makes sense why. On Tatooine, when it's finally time for Anakin's big pod race, arguably the biggest spectacle of the Phantom Menace and what the whole Tatooine level is building up to, we get this epic scene of everyone watching the race. Miss a nurse is in yet? I can't bear to watch. Don't worry, here he comes now. It would have been nice to include a pod racing minigame here, but LucasArts decided to make that its own game, so I guess that makes sense. But at least make a crappy CGI cutscene depicting the race. This is the point of the game when it becomes obvious that the developers used up all their budget. This is even more obvious after the Coruscant level. There's literally an opening crawl explaining the entire third act of The Phantom Menace because the developers couldn't find a way to gamify or visually show Palpatine's rise to power, the Jedi Council scenes, and the hero's journey back to Naboo. The developers were just like, it, do an opening crawl in the middle of the game. We ain't animating any of that shit. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Right. thing sucks! The Coruscant level, by the way, is a strange one. Padme's taxi is destroyed, and you soon find out that a whole slew of bounty hunters are trying to intercept her before she could reach the Senate. Even with the bounty hunters trying to kill her in broad daylight, the people of Coruscant could not be any less concerned. Welcome to Coruscant. How may I be of service? Call the guards, we're being attacked. I'm sorry, sir, but I am simply an information resource droid. I can't help you. Welcome to Coruscant. How may I help you? We're being attacked. You must call the guards. I'm sure it must have been a misunderstanding, sir. It was not a misunderstanding. Call the guards now. I'm sorry, sir, but the comm units in this building are for authorized use only. It's like, dude, you just witnessed three assassins trying to kill the queen right in front of you. Oh, no, nah, I ain't seen nothing. <laughs> I ain't seen nothing. Matter of fact, I'm blind in my left eye. And I guess when it comes down to it, the bulk of the weirdness of this game comes from just how random the NPCs are. They never behave in any way that makes sense, and their dialogue is just so out there. For a PS1 game, there's a shockingly exorbitant amount of voiceovers crammed into it. Most of the NPCs will even have branching dialogue trees. The strange thing is, most of the time, the inclusion of this dialogue ranges from strangely unnecessary to utterly pointless. Would you like some fresh dried chokey? How do you make fresh dried chokey? Well, you'll find yourself some chokey while it's fresh, and you'll leave it in the Dune Sea for three days. <laughs> uh, what else would you like to know? How much does it cost? One trugget for a piece, five truggets for an entire bushel. That is a fair price. Will you accept Republic credits? Yes, I do. <laughs> How much would you like? I would like a box. He doesn't give you any chokey. After all the talking, you guys agree on a price, say cool, here's your chokey, and then he just stands there and doesn't give it to you. I played this level three times, and he never actually gives you the chokey. The only way to get that sweet, sweet chokey is to kill him. And yes, I know there's a David Carradine joke in here somewhere. The force push is a useful move, and one that could lead to a lot of interesting situations with NPCs. I feel bad for killing Anakin's mom earlier, so I'm going to redeem myself by doing something that Anakin, Padme, and the Jedi Council never bothered to do in the movies. Make even the slightest effort to free Anakin's mom from slavery. This stubborn broad really doesn't want to leave her home, so that's where the force push comes in handy. It's not an easy task, especially with Darth Maul trying to kill you, but she's finally made her way to the rest of the group. She refuses to get on the ship, but you know what? I'd say this was a spiritual success. So there you have it. The Phantom Menace is just as fun to play in the year 2023 as it was more than 20 years ago, not in spite of all of its glitches and weird design choices, but because of them. I mean, what other Star Wars game lets you create an alternate timeline where the Empire never rose to power? The Force is strong with you. Strong enough to be a Jedi? No, not really. Oh, then I better get back to my pod racer.
Thank you all for watching this video. If you like what I'm doing at West Does Games, subscribe to my channel. I'm constantly putting out new videos, and I love responding to all your comments. If you grew up with this game, I'd love to hear what weird glitch or scenario you remember playing. That's all for now. Take care, and may the Force be with you. You're stepping on my dress.